Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. Our gospel reading today comes from Mark's gospel, chapter 7, verses 24 through 37. And the he that is being talked about here is Jesus. It says, From there he set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know that he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter, and he said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, said, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And then he said to her, for saying that you may go, the demon has left your daughter. So she went home and found the child lying on the bed and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon toward the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private away from the crowd and put his fingers into his ears and spat and touched his tongue. Then he looked up to heaven, he sighed and he said to him, Epitha, that is be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released and he spoke plainly. And then Jesus told them, ordered them to tell no one. But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. The word of God for the people of God. When I hear these stories, I can't help but think of the times that I have traveled either outside the country or even sometimes to other states or regions of the country. And you may have an experience similar to mine. I call it that first step moment. And it occurs in that first step off of the plane or the train or the bus or even maybe out of the car where you immediately know that something is different. There are new smells, there's new sights, there's new sounds. This was my experience a few years ago when I traveled to Brazil. It was my first solo trip out of the country and I was going to spend some time with some missionaries there to learn about the work that they did. And when I arrived, I was overwhelmed by the unfamiliar. I was met by the busy bustle of a unfamiliar airport. I saw things that I never imagined seeing in an airport. I was looking for my ride. I was trying to understand a new language. And every one of my senses was telling me I was not at home and that I needed to get back home. But I resisted and I stayed. 
And I have to admit, I did feel a little bit of a level of comfort because I had traveled to other places in South America, to other third world countries, and I had some kind of preconceived notions of what this was going to be like. I was used to leaving the airport and kind of going through the city and seeing poorer sections of town that would eventually give way to a little bit more modest area that would eventually give way to a much nicer area. And as you would go out, you would see increasing resources. However, this time I was wrong. It does happen. And as we drove through the city center, what I saw instead was gleaming buildings and white shiny tiles and plenty of resources. And as we went a little further out and we got to the missionaries' base camp, I was met by high walls and a gate. And when we went through them, there was this modest home with a beautiful garden and a pool. To say that I was surprised is a little bit of an understatement. I didn't really understand what was going on. So later that night, after I'd gotten settled in and after worship, I sat down with my host and I asked them, I said, where is the poverty? Where, where do the poor people live? I don't see them. Where do you go to do your work? And they said, well, we do work in the city some. There are places where we're needed and we partner with people there. But mostly we go out to the edges of the city where the pavement stops and we work alongside the families there. That's where there's really need. That's where the poor live. They're kept out of sight. That phrase, kept out of sight, rang in my ears and it broke my heart. Now, I know it's easy for us to leave places alone that make us feel uncomfortable because human nature, it teaches us to circle the wagons, to stay with our group, to be in our place. We have Google Maps that help us navigate our routes and people are more than willing to tell us whether a place is safe or not. Without really trying, we can stay inside our camp inside that place where we live and never really see what or who lies outside of it, even when it's in plain sight. And this was the case in Brazil. They had moved the people out to the edges of town where they really couldn't be seen even though they were there. And it's there in these places outside of the regular kind of community where we find Jesus today. We find him outside of his camp, outside of the place where he knows the people and the things. And we meet him there, and we see how we might join him in sharing hope with people beyond our communities. Now, the story starts in the region of Tyre, Jesus isn't here on a preaching tour, but rather he's here, it says, to get away. He's kind of trying to take a break, I think, on vacation in a way. And after losing his cousin John, feeding 5,000 people, and ministering to countless others, that makes a lot of sense. I think it's fair to say that Jesus could have been tired. So he's traveled outside of his home territory to a place that is heavily populated by the Gentiles. But as is so often the case when Jesus gets there, word spreads. Jesus is here. The healer is here. And so people begin to seek him out, and he's quickly sought out and approached by a person with a very desperate need. A person who to him is doubly an outsider because one, she's a Gentile, and two, she's a woman. But her daughter is suffering with an evil spirit, and without intervention, she most likely will die. And so this mother, like most parents, is willing to do whatever it takes to save her. Even boldly approaching a man and speaking in a way that would have been considered out of turn. She comes to Jesus pleading for her daughter's healing. And when Jesus hears her, the way he responds to her is actually a way that probably leaves most of us feeling a little uncomfortable. He says, let the children be fed first. 
Let the Jewish people be fed first, for it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. My mama would have gotten onto me for saying something like that to anyone. Because what Jesus does here is, is he essentially creates two groups. This is my group, the children, and then there are the dogs. And many people chastised by this kind of comment probably would have chosen just to slink away and to leave the matter alone. But not this woman. No, she boldly confronts Jesus, reminding him that even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And her rebuke expresses the belief that she and her daughter are of value too. And hearing this, Jesus seems to be reminded that his mission is to all the world, and the daughter is healed. The story then goes on and continues into another region, another space outside of Jesus' community, outside of the religious center where the Jewish people live. He's again in a place populated by Gentiles, and again we find this double outsider being brought to Jesus. This time it's not a demon, but a physical impairment that excludes the person from the community. And the person is a Gentile and has this physical impairment, so again, like I said, a double outsider. But in a time when science couldn't explain why a person was deaf and mute, it was considered a consequence of sin and nobody would want to associate with him. This time, it's not an individual, but a group that brings the person to Jesus, who begs for healing. And this time, Jesus jumps into action. He immediately takes that man aside, and he puts his hands in his ears, and he touches his tongue, and he calls upon God to open them, to release them. And the man is set free, and all are left in all. Jesus meets these people at the point of their deepest needs in the places where they are. He hears the cries of others on their behalf and responds with healing. He transforms lives. He transforms the communities. And as a result, he changes the space where the healed occupy, that the healed people occupy in the community, as well as change changes the shape of the community because Jesus heals both physically and spiritually. And he heals not only those who are broken physically and have impairments, but he heals those who are on the other side watching. He restores physical health to the daughter and to the man, and he restores them to their communities, to life, Likewise, in the process, he restores the communities to them and their families. He knows that the woman whose daughter is possessed is most likely always kind of been left out of the community. She probably has lived on the margins. People don't invite her over to the house, and they give her a wide berth when she passes on the street. And likewise, Jesus knows that the man who cannot hear and speak is overlooked and mistrusted maybe followed by whispers of what did he do or what did his family do. He's cut off from his community, not only through speech and sound, but in his whole life. And so Jesus heals the individuals and he restores them and their families to the communities. And then he heals the fracture in the communities and brings the people back to those who have been healed. He restores the people to God and one another. He takes two parts and makes them whole. He sees their value as children of God, and he, because of this, we see the expansion of love beyond boundaries. Jesus knows our human nature. He lived it. He knows that we can overlook, leave out, ignore, and marginalize people. He knows that our ears can be clogged and our tongues can be twisted. That we can find it easier to be silent in a world that is divided into my camp and their camp. 
And the inclination is so natural that even Jesus needed a reminder that his mission was not restricted to one group, that his mission was to God's camp, which includes all of creation. And the reminder came from where it so often does, not from the religious center, but from an encounter in those uncomfortable places, from people who are left out, from the places where our maps don't take us and where few will go. I got a glimpse of this when I was in Brazil, when we went beyond the base camp to the edges of the city. Because as we traveled, the poverty that I saw was really unfamiliar to me. What I knew of poverty really only scratched the surface here. My host said that, of course, where we were going, not many people went. Remember, they were kept out of sight. There were no stores there. And the villages called favelas were pretty much left to their own devices. So much so that when you got there, you could see how they had just strung wires from the main line into their apartments to give them some electricity. They then went on to say that when they first started going there, the people were skeptical and didn't trust them. They'd had too many experiences with people coming there and then disappearing. But the missionary said they kept going over and over, week after week, and they kept showing up. And over time, things changed. The missionaries were welcomed into the community, and the two were made one. And I witnessed this when we arrived, because when we stepped off the van immediately, a young girl came, and she grabbed my hand, and she wanted to show me her cow. who was standing out in the middle of the street. And then we played some games, and we talked with the parents about their concerns about their children. We prayed with a man who was looking for work. We shared food, community, and relationship. We read scripture and sang songs. We had church. And we didn't wait for the people to come to us because most likely it was so far that they were never going to come to where we were. But with Jesus, we went to them and lives were changed. This is what happens when we follow the Spirit. Because you see, the Spirit of God is always moving in and out of spaces and changing lives. The Spirit leads us to people and places. And where the Spirit is, borders fall away and open up space for God to do a new thing. Transforming people and communities with the love of Jesus. Throughout Scripture, we see the theme of mission to the world. In Genesis, God has a mission and humanity has a mission. Later, Israel has a mission. And then Jesus comes with a mission. And then the church becomes an extension of that mission. And Jesus shows us this through his life, death, and resurrection. Throughout his life, we find him not only where his people were, but with the ones who knew very little about faith. And when he died, he didn't die inside the city, inside the religious center, but he died outside the walls between two outsiders, criminals. And then at the resurrection, he commissioned his church to carry the good news to the world. The writer of Hebrews in the 13th chapter reminds us of this when he gives this invitation. So now let's go to him outside the camp and join in the suffering. The suffering, to join in the hard work. We, just like the hearers of this letter, are invited to join Jesus in the places beyond the religious center, beyond our community, our camp, our group. To go to places that may not feel comfortable, to places that are different. Places where God's children also live. And some of these places, they may look just like the places that we occupy. But people don't know Jesus there. The goal of all the mission in the Bible or in Scripture is that creation should flourish through God's generosity, God's infectious generosity. And this is why Jesus healed and loved the people, both physically and spiritually, on the edges outside the camp. 
We are called to do the same. The world tells us that we should shun the dirty, that we should cross the street, that we should move away from people. But Jesus teaches us with word and action to strive for compassion and mercy and to offer community, to offer community with him and with one another. And this is what he did when he saved us. When he transformed our lives, we were empowered to share the transformational love with others. His care for us and others affirms and anticipates the church's need to share God's gifts of grace, peace, healing, and love. Jesus calls us to be the church. But what clogs our ears and silences our tongues? What keeps us inside our camp? Is it our fears, our worries, our schedules? It's easy to become deaf to Jesus' call and mute to sharing the gospel and possessed by our places of comfort. And these stories today, they are a word of hope to those of us with blocked ears, twisted tongues, and stuck bodies. They are stories that remind us that Jesus came to set us free. And when we respond to the gospel, our ears are open, our tongues are released, and our bodies are freed so that we can share the hope of freedom and give people a glimpse of the grace, peace, healing, and love of Jesus Christ. Jesus took a wide-ranging trip outside of his community beyond the geographic and ethnic limits of the Jewish people. And when he did, the people were changed and church happened. Fred Craddock wrote, two things are absolutely essential to church, Jesus Christ and human need. In that place where the church dwells are the rich and the poor, the have and the have-nots, the powerful and the powerless. There are those who are educated and those who are not. There are those who believe and those who don't believe. There are the high and the mighty and the lowly that nobody sees. And in between is the church of Jesus Christ. The church is called to help both the have and the have-nots, the powerful and the powerless. The church is to be the gospel for all the people. And as long as you have Christ and, and as long as you have needs, you have the church. I believe that this is the community that Christ calls us to be, one that is willing to meet people where they are with whatever deep need they have, a community that has open ears and loosened tongues that will willingly go outside of the camp wherever it may be, whether it's at a coffee house, at a park, or across the world and offer healing. A community where love and mercy flow and restoration occurs. A community that offers people through word and action the gift of life with Jesus. There are hurting people in this world and we cannot continue to wait for them to come to us. But instead, Jesus calls us to go with him and to go to them to share the good news of Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. 
Thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image, and what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, he made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir, an organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.